Good evening, everyone. We are pleased to see you at the opening of this, we hope so, great event. And uh, we are very happy to see so many familiar and unfamiliar faces who just tried by all their means to get there and uh, removed all their business tasks, calls and meetings with the clients and managed to come here. Um, just uh, an introduction, I'm going to tell a couple of words and uh, some guidance regarding our, our further actions. So, my name is Alexander Schmarko, I'm an associate of Baker McKenzie and one of the co-organizers of this event. Um, we are thankful for our colleagues from area AA25 and area 40 who helped us to just create this evening. And first of all, and foremost, we are thankful for Mr. Gary Bourne, who managed to find time to come and visit Moscow to participate in this series of these events, to take just with all his courage all the adventures in Moscow <laughs> and welcome you friends. Uh, but uh, the second part of uh, thank you goes to Sergei Saveriev, Savelia Batanov and Barbie, who unfortunately right now is not with us, but he'll come here, of course, and uh, Mr. Andrei Panov from North and Rose, and because uh, these two persons devoted quite a lot of time to help us to bring Harry, <laughs> Gary, Gary Bourne here. <laughs> it was a joke, it was a scenario. <laughs> Sorry. Just testing the reaction. <laughs> so, um, just the main part that we cannot avoid is the thank you part. Uh, we also would like uh, to say uh, thank you to Mikhail Karinin and Sergei Usoskin from Northern Rose, Mikhail, and right. Sergei Usoskin from Double Bridge Law, uh, who prepared an enormous set of magnificent questions that I hope you will enjoy. And uh, of course, uh, thank you section doesn't go without uh, greetings to the sponsors of the event. Uh, law firm Double, Ble uh, Double Bridge Law that gratefully sponsored and helped us to organize this event. And special thank you, of course, of course and credit goes to Victor McKenzie. Uh, and uh, the last thank you we uh, devote to our colleagues to RA40, especially to Olga Vishnevska, Tsvitkova, and uh, from Igor of Putin's Japan and Partners, and uh, to Marina Kchurina, Kiri Gothin. So, uh, a couple of words regarding our further work. So, uh, right now we have 7.30 and uh, Mikhail and Sergei have one hour for their questions. Uh, later, we'll have a question and answer session, also for 30 minutes. So, the event, uh, the official part of the event is not going to uh, be late. The latest time that we're going to finish is uh, 9.10. So after, afterwards, we're going, to, we're going to have reception, drinks, and some snacks, and I hope you will enjoy networking. Um, regarding the last st stage of our work with questions and answers, we would appreciate if you will follow the principle of one person, one question. Because that's just a recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my author, of course. <laughs> and uh, because there are many um, adventurous and uh, motivated people that would like to ask their question to Mr. Gary Bourne, uh, for this reason, we would like to give to everyone sitting here to ask a question that he is interested in. Thank you very much. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you for to Baker McKenzie for hosting us. Uh, it is a pleasure that I was the head of civil assistance of Baker McKenzie to host a lot of these arbitration events. Uh, but uh, because we are on a tight schedule, uh, I guess we go directly to uh, questions. And so uh, when we prepared for the interview, uh, we told Mr. Warren that we are going to devote most of the interview to the book. And I, I, made, I made some stickers. So we're going to go through some footnotes. Uh, 
but 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 that that was a ruse. We are actually ask, uh, going to ask you some <laughs> different questions, uh, and I would first uh, uh, invite my colleague uh, Mr. Kali to start with the questions. Thank you, and again, thanks to Victor McKenzie and Dr. Bristol. Um, right, so uh, what I have with Pathways is because the uh, seminar or the interview or the chat is called uh, Five Easy Steps or Not So Easy Steps, I'll uh, try to propose a list of five kind of engines that could help a young professional reach the sky in the application practice, and uh, we will ask you to help us calibrate these questions. Um, the first engine or a step is probably because arbitration is international, uh, it's languages. So the very frequent question that everyone asks is what second most helpful language is after English? Is that French, is that German, is that Spanish, or is that maybe Chinese, and why? So let me start by, by thanking everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, of course, repeat the thanks that have already been, been given to Bank McKenzie Double Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> also to all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules. I appreciate it very much. I think we should also thank the designers of the fireplace. It took great ingenuity and creativity to come up with that. And, still be in compliance with building codes and fire safety regulations. So, thank you. Um, so, uh, language. It's widely said, what's the most widely spoken language in the world? Bad English. Um, it is true that the, the first language, if you want to, to learn something other than your native tongue, for international arbitration is, is, is probably English. I think the second, second language, I'm not sure there's a right choice in terms of which language makes the, the second most sense. And, and the languages that, that you describe, French, Spanish, um, and maybe Chinese, um, are, are logical choices. I might flip the order. I think Spanish is increasingly important. If you wanted to be exotic, you could think about Portuguese. If you look at the ICC statistics for recent years, um, Brazilian arbitrations have been very high up. One has to be a little careful drawing conclusions from just one or two years statistics, but, but Portuguese is still an interesting, interesting choice. For my money, I think I would choose Spanish. Latin America seems to have enduring enduring strength as a source of insoluble disputes, and that's a good thing from our perspective. And I do think language is important. Um, I guess I would focus on, on English as the language of this particular proceeding suggests. Um, thank you. And the second part of the language question is that can we all happen to be uh, fluent Russian speakers. Uh, so the question is, and we all know that uh, Russian clients, Russian speaking clients, generate quite a lot of international disputes. Uh, but at the same time, many of these disputes go to international firms without any presence in Russia, and sometimes handled by teams without any Russian-speaking members. So uh, what I was wondering uh, is, is there any way for Russian-speaking practitioners to use this Russian language as a benefit? Definitely, and I, I think pretty much in the way that, that you've already described. I think there's there's a, a kind of natural advantage also to, to being a Russian speaker. Lots of people speak speak German or, or, or Spanish or or some of the other languages we discussed, French, um, who aren't from those countries originally. Russia has a Russian speakers have a bit more of a monopoly and, and I think that's an inherent advantage. I'm not sure how one uses that beyond the, the sort of client relationship. Um, aspect of, of international arbitration, but that's that's critically important. Okay, so the second step, probably once someone speaks English, is probably uh, international mood course because this is the first moment when a student can get some feeling of what arbitration is like. And we understand that some of or many of the associates that work in Wilmer Hale uh, have certain mood court backgrounds. So we were run, wondering what is the you know, what uh, distinguishes a person who is a graduate who had gone through uh, a mood court and from those who had not. And do you think that this is an important part, or is it not so important? I think that's a good a good question, and I'm not sure that it's necessarily the the this mood court. There are obviously other other types of courts, investment investment arbitration mood courts, the Jessup mood court, um, other other examples. And I don't know whether it's at, at Wilmer or, or other law firms, um, Norton Rose, Baker McKenzie, 
on Double Bridge, um, that, that participation in a moot court is in and of itself an important credential. I don't think we hire based on this person went to the moot court and therefore she gets an advantage over this person who, who didn't. I think it's more that there's a natural affinity of people who have the kind of background that we, but I think also other, other law firms look for and moot court participation, a natural affinity in terms of, of languages, in terms of the kind of courses that, that one takes. And so I think more important than, than participating in the moot court, although I think the moot court, I think this moot court is a great experience. Uh, I unfortunately, um, they didn't have the moot court when I went to law school. I know that. I know that I would have loved to do that, like I think everyone else who participates does. But, but I don't think that, that participating in the moot court, aside from being a lot of fun and, and interesting challenges, it's not an on-off switch. I think more important is doing the things that are that go around it that are associated with it. Could you clarify what are the things that go around it because you mentioned? The, it's a it's a cluster of things, but to some extent things you've already mentioned. Language is is obviously important. Taking courses in in international law, international arbitration, investment arbitration, all the sorts of, of courses that that involve subjects that you would frequently have in an international arbitration, international sales, transactions, project finance, um, international regulatory courses, um, participating in international law events of various sorts. It doesn't have to be the VIS, as I mentioned. It could be Jessup or some other type of, of international training. Um, then interning or working as a summer associate or something of, of that sort at not just an international firm, but a firm with an international practice, a domestic firm that has a strong international practice, and there are many of those here in Moscow and, and other places, I think is also an, sort of an important signal or credential that, that people look at writing, and, and I'm sure this will be a question that, that you get to in due course, but, but writing shows, in, in the field of international arbitration or international law more generally, shows a, a kind of an ambition on the one hand, a, a kind of ability to analyze and explain things in writing, which is for better, for worse, what we mostly do as lawyers. Uh, it shows a focus on academic matters, which I think is associated with international arbitration and which people in international arbitration tend to value. So I think doing doing that, what I call a cluster of things that are similar to, to a moot court experience, but are exactly the same thing is important. Um, since you mentioned the courses uh, and internships, the next possible step for engine could be doing an internship in, a, for example, uh, an arbitral institution, or it could be an LLM program. Uh, so the uh, probably the first question that I'll ask is whether the, whether you think that uh, an LLM it is better to have an LLM that is specifically focused on arbitration, or is it better to have, for example, an English law LLM? So I have I have personal views on this that that may not be shared um, universally, and I think you probably care more about the universal view than than my personal view. My own personal view is that. The specialized LLM programs in international arbitration uh, would not be my first choice. Uh, I know Patricia Shaughnessy and Gabriela Kapokola will probably wrinkle their noses at me um, for saying this, but I think one learns more and uh, gets better training and in a sense diversifies one's bets options better by doing what we could call a general LLM than by doing a specialized LLM. The, the specialized LLMs um, limit you to some extent. You can take courses, obviously, in contract law, and commercial law, and so forth, but the focus is so heavily on dispute resolution that I think sometimes the other areas get neglected. I think it also pigeonholes you a little bit for hiring into international arbitration practices. The reality is, in a lot of firms, international arbitration practices don't necessarily do their own hiring. There's, there's firm-wide hiring and, 
and your credentials, your experience may be evaluated by people outside the international arbitration practices. Some firms may want to hire somebody that can do both international arbitration and something else for a while. You yourself may not know. You may think you like international arbitration, but the reality is after you've done three document disclosure um, exercises, you don't like it so much anymore. You want to go do anti-monopoly law or something else. And in that circumstance, having done uh, a general LLM and having gained skills in, in that field may, may put you in, in a better position. Remember also that international arbitration is enormously about the procedures that this, this interview is supposedly going to concern. Um, but it's also about substance. It's also about, about corporate law, at least in most countries. Um, corporate matters. Um, it's also about commercial matters and, and, and other issues of substantive law and making sure you get a really strong grounding in that makes you a, a, a much better international arbitration practitioner. You spend a lot more time as an international arbitration practitioner arguing about civil codes and contract terms than you do about esoteric details of the separability presumption. And so I, my advice always is um, focus on a general LLM. One moment for a commercial break. I am releasing this year a webinar series, a webinar series on international <laughs> commercial arbitration. It is 90 hours of online instruction about international arbitration. You, can, you will be able to watch it if I have my way for free. If my publisher has her way, you'll have to pay some money. But if I have my way, you won't have to pay very much money. The reason I say that is I really question the value of specialized LLM programs that require people from lots of different countries, take your pick, Nigeria, Cameroon, Indonesia, the Philippines, Uruguay, or Peru, to take a year out of their professional careers and reside in a high cost location like Stockholm or Geneva, spend 50 or 75,000 US dollars in order to get a year's instruction in international arbitration. There surely must be a more efficient way to do that. The webinars that I designed are <laughs> doing that. And so um, I, I think that studying in general, of course, made sense, but there have to be more efficient ways to learn international arbitration. And as we all know, international arbitration promises to be efficient and expeditious. That's the aim of the webinars. OK, commercial breakdown. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, so since you, kind of, uh, since you recommend a more general LLM, would you recommend a specialized internship in an international institution? I think that's a little different for a variety of reasons. And I do recommend internships at, at arbitral institutions. I don't necessarily recommend long uh, stays at arbitral institutions, but when I, I was asked, I guess it was three and a half years ago, to, to, to become the president of the Singapore International Arbitration Center's Court of Arbitration. At first, my reaction was, seriously? Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to be the, the inside an arbitral institution? What could I possibly learn? I know everything there is to know about arbitration. So why should I go to an arbitral institution? I was completely wrong about that. I learned so much by being inside an an arbitral institution. As counsel or even as arbitrators, we see the world of arbitration through, in a sense, like a keyhole. We see, little, we see individual cases with unbelievable intensity. We see the details of those cases. We know everything there is about the, the individual characteristics of that arbitration right through the arbitral process from, from the request for arbitration to the constitution of the tribunal to, to procedure order number one to the evidentiary hearing to the award. When you're in an arbitral institution, you see arbitration in a completely different way. You don't see it through a keyhole, but through a kind of fisheye lens, a little bit like a CCTV camera that watches everything that goes past. And you don't see anything with any detail, but you see a whole lot of everything, especially in the beginning of the case when there can be lots of procedural pathologies or curiosities or mishaps and the end of the case when the award gets scrutinized. Seeing that, seeing if you're an, if you're an intern or an associate or counsel at an arbitral institution, seeing for say six months or three months 150 cases come in 
seeing the tribunal get constituted, seeing what 150 different requests for arbitration and answers look like is a really enlightening experience. I learned a whole lot, and I think I think younger lawyers can, can learn a whole lot in terms of developing their skills. Beyond developing your skills, you get a credential on your, your resume, your CV, that, that international law firms and domestic law firms pay attention to if they have cases in front of in front of the ICC, in front of the SIAC, in front of some other arbitral institution, having somebody that was counsel in that institution or an intern in the institution can be a valuable resource and a valuable um, sales sales point to, to potential clients. Okay, and since you mentioned the uh, moment of when one should do this, do you think it's more sensible to start a career with this, to have a couple of years at the law firm than to do an internship or maybe an LLM or work? And kind of, is it still reasonable to do an LLM or an internship after five or 10 years of practice? I'm not sure that there's a, there's a one size fits all solution to, to that question. A little bit like arbitration, I think it needs to be tailored to the specific parties and, and circumstances. I think in general, though, it probably makes sense to do these sorts of things earlier rather than later. I think it makes sense to do them earlier because it's less of, of an interruption in your career if you're, if you're 7, 8, 10, 12 years out. You have, you have sort of career progression issues that are probably more pressing. You don't want to get distracted from, from what you're doing to develop your career at home by going abroad for a period of time. Uh, that's particularly true, I think, for, for LLM programs. Uh, therefore, I would suggest doing it early. Whether you do it immediately after law school or after a year or two at a law firm, I, I think is a, is a judgment call. I think an advantage of doing it a couple of years after you've been in a law firm is it gives you a good excuse to leave the law firm. <laughs> um, and to explain why you left the law firm. Um, people are always wondering, why did somebody leave? Is it because they can't get along with people? Is it because they weren't well regarded at the firm? Is that really a negative red flag we should pay attention to? If they went off and did an LLM and then came back and started with someone else, that's, a, that's an easy explanation. That may be a cynical view of the world, but I think it probably is true. But that's a very helpful suggestion. <laughs> Which doesn't apply to my growth school, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next step would probably be uh, for someone to actually find their first employer. And what I was wondering is how crucial for your, in your opinion, it is to start in a law firm that actually practices arbitration and that is recognized for its arbitration practices. Would you discount uh, years of experience that someone might have in the beginning as doing, for example, litigation or doing a uh, two-year rotation program with four different seats? No, not at all. Um, I think from our perspective, and I suspect many international law firms' perspective, one of the most important things, for better or for worse, is grades, law school grades, and, and other, other kinds of, of credentials like that. That is hugely important. Experience at a quality institution, whether it's a domestic law firm, an international law firm, whether it's doing corporate work or doing litigation or doing something else is, is a, a plus. Um, oddly, I'm not sure how much international arbitration experience at an international firm really counts as a positive. If somebody's moving from, from one international firm's arbitration practice to another international firm's arbitration practice, and you have to ask why. Why isn't it working out at the first one? Um, if you're moving from a very strong domestic litigation practice where you've gotten good experience in, in, in the litigation process, in the dispute resolution process, good grounding in, in substantive law, those are, those are strengths. Those are things that both we and other, other employers would look at positively. In a sense, they bring us something that we don't have so much of and therefore are a scarce resource. We've got a ton of international arbitration experience. And the fact that you had two years at Sherman and Sterling is, well, that's sort of interesting. But it doesn't bring us anything new. And why are you leaving Sherman? Uh, so I think, in general, if, if what you want to do is get grounding in some substantive disciplines, get grounding in your own legal system, there's no reason not to do that at a high quality domestic firm. I think there's a lot to be said for getting that kind of initial grounding at, 
at a non-arbitration practice. I did, I started out doing things other than international arbitration and um, perhaps it's, it's my own misjudgment, but I think that was a good thing. I think it gave, gives one skills that you can then use in international arbitration subsequently. Thank you. And the last engine, and we want to ask whether this is actually an engine, is whether one should author articles and uh, engage in speaking opportunities, whether you think that this has to profile the young practitioner or anything, or whether the young practitioner should rather concentrate on improving their legal knowledge and maybe read a book or two. Mm -hmm. So again, these are these are not necessarily universal views, these are these are my personal views. They may be they may therefore be very wrong. I, I think speaking at conferences is usually, for younger lawyers, a waste of time. Usually, you speak at a conference as one of, depends on how big the conference is, but between 15 and 50 other speakers. You therefore automatically put yourself in the same category as them, and therefore don't really distinguish yourself. You also are mostly talking to your competitors, not to either clients or, or others that you might want to impress. Finally, putting all that aside, the conference ends in like a day, and you've spent hopefully two or three days preparing for this conference because there's no point in going there unless you're gonna make a really good impression. And then it's done. It's like, a, it's like drinking a Coke. Um, you get a sugar and caffeine high, and it's gone the next the next hour, if not the next hour, the next day. <clears throat> I think in a different category is writing articles and writing books. Now, there is a proliferation of both, so you gotta write special articles and special books that will impress people. But books and articles are forever. Um, they're out there, and people will cite them and rely on them and remember you as the author. Coming up with a new idea, coming up with a uh, an impressive way to say something that will attract other people's attention, getting cited by others and, and especially by national courts or arbitral tribunals because you figured out the solution to witness conferencing or something else, I think is, is important to career development. I also think that, that none of this can be a one-shot effort. Building your career is like building a snowman. When I say that in Singapore, nobody really understands. <laughs> it's a little bit like in Singapore, there's never been a fireplace, even though we have fireside chats every, every couple of weeks. But you understand here in Russia very well what it's like to build a snowman. It's an ongoing process, and you roll it in, and it's one thing accumulates on another. And over time, even though you thought that first article on some obscure aspect of witness conferencing was something nobody in the world would ever pay any attention to, in a couple more months you write another article on cross-examination, in a few more months you write an article on opportunity to be heard, and then at some point some other, some, some other arbitration practitioner cites a couple of your articles, and then someone else asks you to write a chapter in a book, and over time, like a snowman or snow woman, you have accumulated a reputation. People think you actually know a whole lot about, about, about the process of examination and due process in international arbitration, and clients look to you for that, and lawyers at other law firms think about you for that, and, and you have developed a reputation because you have done things that last and that, that make a lasting, important impression. I think that is more valuable than networking at, uh, at an arbitration conference. So you don't invite everyone to stay for the <laughs> Would that help us to shrug it? Yes. yes. Uh, once you get uh, a job at an arbitration practice, you start asking yourself a bit of different questions. I, I think you heard this question being asked by younger colleagues uh, quite frequently, and that is, uh, when do I get the chance to speak before an arbitral tribunal and make my own pleadings? And I, I guess I, I would ask you two questions. Uh, one is, when do you think is the appropriate time? And seeing that in many um, firms, and this is generally still the practice that younger lawyers don't get this chance, what, what the opportunities are for them to improve their advocacy skills, because ultimately they are expected. 
uh, to have them. Uh, so this would be one question, and the other would be uh, uh, in your um, perspective, from your perspective as an arbitrator, um, an argument is frequently made that for a senior arbitrator, in order to be credible, the advocate must be at least equally senior. Do you think this is really a, 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 a major concern? So a, a cluster of, of good questions there. Um, pe people like arbitrations are like snowflakes. Everyone is unique, everyone is different. And again, you can't have a, a sort of automatic rule. You can have an inflexible rule for everybody. Somebody who, one person may be a really good oral advocate after, after two years qualification, another person might not feel comfortable with, with oral advocacy until they're four, five, six, six years out. Uh, and so I think the answer may depend to some extent on, on the person. In general though, I think pushing the envelope, being adventuresome, doing things that are a little bit outside your comfort zone is, is usually a, a desirable thing. And we, we for better or for worse, push people to, to try to start having some sort of speaking role in front of tribunals as, as early as possible. That doesn't mean they get to do the opening. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they get to cross the most important witness. It does mean that they get to put on to do the direct examination, the redirect examination of, of smaller witnesses, and soon after that to begin doing cross-examination of less important witnesses and also um, argument on, on procedural points. Um, we try to, it, it's strange because the big law firms, the way that, that, that your management and the, the compensation structure of big law firms work is, is your greatest incentive is, is to have very big cases with huge teams. And you have a very big case with a huge team, multiple partners, even more multiple associates. The associates down at the bottom of the food chain really have the most limited opportunities, not to get eaten, but to say something in the process of getting eaten. Um, and, and therefore, in order really to give opportunities to younger lawyers, you need to take smaller cases, including at a big firm that ordinarily wouldn't be so excited about, about smaller cases. We try, to, we try to do that. We try to take smaller cases and to present clients with, with the alternatives that make sense for, for smaller cases. Those alternatives necessarily involve lots of people um, at, at more junior levels and, and people at more junior levels having having substantial roles in the arbitration, which include doing doing openings and, and things like that. We don't always manage to find cases for everybody and 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 to staff them in that way. But I think that's something that practices should should actually look look hard for. I don't I don't at all buy the the um, and I spent my whole life breaking the the mantra um, or the rule that you gotta be as old as the people that you appear in front of. I spent most of my life appearing in front of people with, with much grayer or less hair than me. Um, and, and I hope that, that they weren't offended by that and that they listened to, to what I have today. I think in today's world as well, um, with, with both greater international diversity, greater gender diversity, greater ethnic diversity, there's also greater age diversity. and and more senior arbitrators um, are, are accustomed to hearing more junior counsel appear in front of them. I, some, of the best, some of the best counsel that I've, that I've had appear in front of me have in fact been quite junior lawyers who perhaps because they were junior were also quite well prepared lawyers. And, and uh, maybe we'll get to a question at some point about how important preparation and, and hard work is to, to this part of the process. Um. And this was a demonstration of the visionary uh, of, the, of Mr. Bourne uh, in seeing what the next question is going to be. Uh, I read in your bio that you had uh, represented clients in 600 arbitrations. You sat as arbitrator in 175 cases. And that's a lot of stress. Uh, the hearing uh, weeks are back-to-back -back work and then preparation the hard preparation that is required to present the case is the best that was hard work as well. So what would be your advice to practitioners in terms of managing stress, in terms of surviving those weeks in the hearings? Do you have any know-how of how you approach this? Mm. <laughs> those are very, 
They're very observant questions. And that bio was a couple of years old, so I'm even more stressed tonight, today, than I was <laughs> at the time that it, that it was written. Um, and if you look at statistics in different countries, I, I, I know the ones in, in Europe and the United States, for the, the lifespan and, and health of mitigators, they're truly scary. Um, the, the rate of alcoholism and drug abuse, the heart failures and stress-related psychological disorders are, are, are really frightening. Litigators have, in some ways, and by litigators I include us arbitrators, um, arbitration council have, have in some ways a, a, an awful job. You, you have unreasonable clients almost inevitably. You have a demanding, you know, you have some really smart person on the other side, a whole team of people on the other side whose sole object in life is to embarrass and humiliate you. Um, uh, what a fun way to spend your life. Um, I, I think, and I do think, I do think being able to manage the inevitable stress that, that comes with that is, is a real challenge. I'm, I'm tempted in a way to quote the American president, I won't say his name, but but, but he always says, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but the problem is it actually does matter. <laughs> and and if, if you pay attention to what you're doing, then, then you realize that everything you say matters. And, and when you're in a hearing with a live note unfolding in front of you, and there's no reset button, you can't, if you ask the wrong question, or if you ask one question too many and get the world's worst answer, or if you answer a question wrong in response to the tribunal question during your opening or closing, you can't you can't replay it. It's it's done and it's it's in it's in live though. Um, I think there are a few a few tricks to managing stress. One one I think uh, it's really important, although there's a huge temptation not to do it, to always get enough sleep which in turn means always get enough exercise. Now I know some people don't need a whole lot of sleep, um, but getting, getting a proper and healthy lifestyle is unbelievably important. I know I sound like my grandmother or your <laughs> grandmother. Um, um, are you eating well? Are you getting enough sleep? Um, but that's actually really, really important. I also think, in a sense, recognizing that you're always gonna make mistakes and you won't always do things right um, and therefore not thinking the world has ended when you do one thing wrong is, is hugely important. Be sort of humble and modest in your own expectations. Also be honest with yourself. Don't, don't convince yourself that stuff wasn't a mistake because at some point you'll realize probably at the worst possible moment that it actually was a mistake and you won't have done anything to, to sort of fix it or address it. When, when you see that you've done something that you wish you'd done differently, then, then immediately take steps to address it, whether it's to you know, put in an amended submission or to tell the witness to disclose his document after all, or do whatever it is that, that ameliorates the problem that you have identified. Don't, don't, don't sweep the problem underneath the rug and assume that it's just gonna go away. Because you'll keep thinking in the back of your mind about that problem underneath the rug and it will stop letting you sleep and it will haunt you. So you oughtn't to do that. Um, other than that, um, I'm not sure. Have a, uh, having a really good team and delegating to a good team is hugely important. You can't do everything yourself. If you try to do everything yourself, you won't do anything that well, and and you'll also be crazily stressed. Um, one thing that one thing that helps is is um, is getting older. There's some disadvantages to getting older, <laughs> but one of the advantages is as you get older, you make so many mistakes, you 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 don't get stressed about them so much. <laughs> um, I mean, you realize how to put mistakes into, into context and, and into proportion, hopefully. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I'll suggest you go slightly less stressful direction, and you already mentioned uh, academic knowledge and the, um, the importance of uh, learning about the, uh, the academic aspect of arbitration, uh, arbitration being a subject that is uh, attractive in, the, in this sense to explore. What do you think about the PhD? Uh, in, do you think it's an escape from practice of law? Do you think that it gives uh, a, a lawyer some useful experience that then can be brought back to practice of law? 
And uh, so this would be one question on the usefulness of a PhD, and also you, uh, I, I keep asking two questions in, in advance, uh, but I would <laughs> still do it. Uh, you have... Uh, Protect me. That's my role today. Yeah, Bumaheva has an academic in residence program, um, scholar in residence, uh, and uh, what what's the purpose of this program, and what's the, what are the benefits that you see in this program? So that, those are good questions, and, and again, I have a kind of personality, a syncretic view based on my own experience. I'll try to universalize it as as much as I can. Um, I think doing academic things like doing governmental or public affairs things is an important supplement to or complement to international arbitration practice, also other types of legal practice. I think when you think about the role of a lawyer, you need to answer, resolve a whole range of different types of problems. And you need to convince clients so that they'll hire you that you can solve those problems. I think that although being a really good technical lawyer and being well-known and accomplished and an expert in your field of practice is really important, it's closely related to things around it, including academic, political, governmental, um, public affairs um, activities. And I therefore think it's a good thing for younger lawyers and mid-level lawyers, other lawyers, to, in a sense, have several irons in the fire or several several paths in which they develop skills that relate to their basic legal expertise, the basic subject matter, in our case, international arbitration. As part of that, I think academic efforts that are like doing a PhD make sense. I, I do think, though, and this is based on my personal experience, that there are better ways to get that experience than by taking a PhD program and being a student. I always think the way that you learn most in life is by teaching, not by learning. When you have to teach something, you learn it better than when you have to learn it, because you actually then have to get up and explain what you learned, whether if you're a student, you just have to pass some exam or write some paper. If you actually have to get up and teach, and I know in some PhD programs, part of the program is, 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 is being the, the instructor and so forth. Um, when I, so a little bit of a personal digression, if you get to ask two questions, I get to make personal digressions <laughs> and, and commercial advertisements. So, so, so after, I, after law school, I did the thing that many American law students do. I went off and clerked for some judges. You work for a judge, you're basically a personal slave for a couple of years. I did that. I then took a year off. I hitchhiked around Africa. I came back and started at the law firm where I started. After three months, I was like so totally miserable, I left. And I went to teach in, in, in uh, an international law program at a, at a law school. And I, I really left because I didn't ever want to go back. I thought being in a law firm, a big law firm like Baker McKenzie or Norris was like the worst thing you could imagine. Um, <laughs> and I'm not sure what I would have thought about other law firms. <laughs> so I went and talked. After, with, with the benefit of a, of a year teaching, in which, a, a year in which, because I actually had to get up and teach a bunch of students stuff, and I learned a huge amount, um, I, I, with that year's perspective, the law firm didn't look quite so bad, and I went back to the law firm. I wasn't sure I was going to stay at the law firm, but going back to the law firm with a year's academic experience was enormously helpful in terms of developing my skills. I knew stuff because I'd had to teach it that all the partners didn't know. I'd, I'd learned because I had to get up and teach international law because I got up and taught a course on international, private international law in the United States, things that the partners in my practice didn't know. And that was really valuable. I also had a kind of credibility because, and it's the equivalent of a PhD, because I've been a professor at some law school. Um, I think that is a really useful 
an important step, both substantively in terms of developing your skills and in terms of marketing, in terms of presentation to, to the outside world. I've talked so long, I've forgotten your <laughs> second question. <laughs> Scholarly residence. Why do we, this is the commercial part of the, <laughs> of the answer. Well, we, we have something called scholar in residence, which means pretty much what we want it to mean. It means we, we invite professors from, from around the world, professors in this room, instructors, research assistants should think about applying, um, to spend time at, at the firm and participate in the activities at, at the firm. We need to do appropriate conflicts checks and that sort of thing. The amount of time that people stay depends on their interest and their career, to some extent their seniority. Um, it really doesn't depend so much on our needs uh, because we're, we're quite flexible about that. We don't, because they're academics, <clears throat> pay them much at all, although we take care of living expenses and, and, and that sort of thing. The idea isn't they're gonna come and make a lot of money. The idea is that for professors that are interested in the practice of law, and especially what we do in international dispute resolution, and a feeling that they can't otherwise see it so well, for them to come and just be part of the environment at a law firm and also to make presentations to, to our group, to listen to our group make presentations to them, to present works in progress to, to our group, to give a public lecture, all of that they think benefits them. We think it benefits them too, but more importantly, they think so. We get benefits because they, they know things, they've studied from an academic perspective, particular aspects of what we do. We try to take people who do international arbitration, but also people who do things in our live fields, um, international trade, some international regulatory, private international law, some public international law stars. We've had people who've been, been sort of very robust critics of international arbitration or some types of international arbitration, Professor Sornaraja, well-known Singaporean critic of investor state arbitration spent three months at, at, at the firm, and we hope that it, it softened some of his hard edges. Um, but, but at the end of the day, it's, it's designed to be a process that, that benefits the, the scholar, but also benefits us. Thank you, and I pass the uh, microphone to Mike. Michael. Thank you. Um, so the next question or a few questions that I want to ask is about enforcement and especially enforcement in jurisdictions that are not uh, so efficient friendly. Um, not to call them my idiosyncratic as you call them in the book. Um, so what uh, may, I was thinking maybe you have an example of a case where you had to advise a client who had to enforce a jurisdiction which wasn't very arbitration friendly. And I was wondering if you have any idea of how to persuade a judge who is not very familiar with arbitration and is not very arbitration uh, friendly in a way. So uh, I'm not sure there's any there's any um, universal answer to, to that particular question. And I think that the circumstances may very much depending on the, the characteristics of the country, which, which is said to be not arbitration friendly. Some, some countries aren't arbitration friendly because of a lack of experience. And, and in that circumstance, um, sort of patient description of, of the international framework for recognizing arbitral awards, um, New York Convention, model law, decisions from, from courts in other jurisdictions, um, I think can, can be very important. In, in that regard, a number of international institutions have made, I think, really important steps in trying to I wouldn't say educate judiciaries because I think that's likely to offend judiciaries, but, but familiarize judiciaries and have a dialogue with national judiciaries and also legislatures about international dispute resolution. Uh, I, I do some work with the Asian Development Bank in, in the Pacific Islands where a number of the jurisdictions haven't even ratified the New York Convention or adopted the Institutional Model Law and talking both with local judges and with local government officials, legislatures about the benefits of the New York Convention, what it entails, the benefits of the model law, what countries have adopted it with what experience, 
I think is, is, is a really important first step get it to both getting them to accept the convention and or the model law, but also then once having accepted it, to, to faithfully implement its, its terms. In some jurisdictions, to be, to be frank, some of that may be a waste of time. Um, it, it's not a, a lack of familiarity, but it's a hostility. You can think of some Latin American jurisdictions which at least periodically go through that, that type of, of phase. And in those circumstances, I'm not sure you can familiarize judges all you want, but the reality is um, if, if they're not listening, you're not really getting an opportunity to, to be heard and why, why, why waste your effort? Um, one of the benefits of the New York Convention, obviously, is there are 159 places you can recognize and enforce awards. And as some of those countries have, have discovered, um, there are a lot of risks in not uh, complying with the awards, even if you know you're not going to be forced to do so in your own home courts. You may be forced to do so elsewhere. The other side of the question about courts is probably about competition that might come to, uh, from courts. And uh, we've seen uh, courts like Netherlands, Netherlands and France uh, open their courts that will operate in English. We've also seen courts, for example, in Dubai and in Kazakhstan that are being opened and are supposed to operate uh, under English law and with actual English law experienced uh, judges. Do you see that there is a bit of competition in international disputes from courts? So yesterday at the, at the Higher School of Economics, I gave a lecture called Past, Present, and Future of, of International Arbitration. And some of you may have, have, have attended, attended that lecture. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal, plagiarize a little bit from, from bits of that lecture here. The, the competition between courts and, and arbitration isn't new, it's not a phenomenon that began <coughs> this decade or, or with, with Dutch, German, Dubai, Kazakh, Singaporean, Chinese um, efforts to create so-called international courts. Courts have been jealous of, of arbitration, hostile to, to arbitration for, for centuries, I, I think of, of in, in France, the, the decision in, in 1843 by the French Court of Cassation, which basically said that, that agreements to arbitrate future disputes were, were invalid. Um, the, the court, interestingly, justified its decision um, in, in part by the following logic. If we upheld this agreement to arbitrate, then everybody would arbitrate. <laughs> Therefore, we shouldn't have all this agreement to arbitrate. Uh, there wouldn't be anything left for us to do. Um, and one sees occasionally, think of um, and his, his, his thinking, his words, and probably haven't made it to, to everybody in this audience, but think of what Lord Thomas, one of the chief judicial officers in the United Kingdom said, said not long ago. Arbitration is, is stealing cases from from English courts, it's therefore hindering, retarding the development of, of the English English common law. The the sense of, of judicial hostility that occasionally arises, the competition between arbitration and courts, in that in that way isn't isn't a new phenomenon. Um, that said, the overwhelming trend over the last century, but particularly since we're celebrating today the 60th anniversary of the New York Convention, or celebrating this year the 60th anniversary of the, the New York Convention, the overwhelming trend has been in the opposite direction. It has been cooperation between national courts on the one hand and international arbitral tribunals on the other hand. There are some scholars who treat international arbitration as a kind of separate legal regime, an autonomous legal order that is distinct from national law that's beyond the interference of national courts. I think those are fairy tales, um, not, not birthday songs, but fairy tales that, that, we, that, that really don't reflect reality. International arbitration, particularly under the New York Convention, is a public-private partnership that recognition and enforcement of international arbitration agreements depends critically on national courts. Recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards, as your question suggests, depends critically on, on national courts. National courts have done 
for the most part, nothing's perfect, but for the most part, I think an extremely good job over the last 20 years in recognizing and enforcing arbitral awards, arbitration agreements, and, and that is a, a very, a very positive development is essential to the continued strength and growth of, of international commercial arbitration. What do I make of the interest in some quarters, some countries to create international courts? First, I think there ought to be some inquiry into deceptive advertising because these are not international courts. You can call them international courts, but they're national courts. The, the Singapore International Commercial Court remains a national court established under the Singaporean Constitution. The German and the Dutch courts, even if they speak English, are still <laughs> German and Dutch courts answerable to German and Dutch political authorities established and selected by German and Dutch political authorities as with the Singaporean International Commercial Court, the Chinese International Commercial Court. One ought to recognize, therefore, that they're international courts. One ought also not to pretend that their decisions are arbitral awards. The European Investment Court tries to call its judgments arbitral awards so it can get the benefit of the New York Convention, but just calling something an international court doesn't make it international any more than calling a national court judgment or even an international court judgment and award make it an arbitral award. I worry that there's a tendency to establish national courts in this way as something that will undermine the successful history of cooperation between national courts and international arbitration. I think it's a good thing to try to improve national court mechanisms to make them more user-friendly, to make them able to use the dominant language of international commerce, English, to make them more suited to resolving commercial disputes. But I worry that there's a, an unstated subtext reflected a little bit in the Prunier and the Lord Thomas decisions of jealousy of the arbitral process and that that subtext will undermine the commitment to recognizing and enforcing international arbitration agreements. Steve Schwebel, a former president of the International Court of Justice, described the New York Convention in, it took me two volumes in the first edition to say this, it took him two words. He said of the New York Convention and of international arbitration more generally, it works. And he's right. It does. It provides an efficient and fair means of international dispute resolution. I think doubling down on the commitment to make that process work even better, which is what arbitral institutions are doing, is the right course. I worry about distractions from that important effort, and I think that national courts that try to pretend that they're really international courts and try to resolve disputes which aren't necessarily where the parties want them to be resolved is a, is a step that is inconsistent with the historic commitment the states have shown over the last 20, over the last 60 years to international dispute resolution. Um, thank you. Uh, I think we'll go from course, actually, to, to, uh, to writing, actually, to improving your profile in international arbitration, because uh, the next uh, section of questions would be about uh, acquisition of clients, and I think I wouldn't ask you for any know-how, because <laughs> you would not necessarily, perhaps, if, if, you, if you would uh, want to share, that would be very welcome, but I'll ask some more general questions, uh, such as, uh, how do you find time with 600 applications and 175 and more appointments to write this? Because uh, many of us have been struggling to write even single book. I know you write a lot, so do you have any advice for younger and less uh, organized offers? So I'm going to steal advice from other people, and, and you know, I'm sure you've heard the saying, you should do what I say, not what I do. Um, what I said previously was you should get enough sleep. And the reason I knew you should get enough sleep is that I didn't. Um, and that's the only way you can write something like this, by, by, by really um, burning the candle, at least in English you would say burning the candle at both ends. 
Um, it, it, it takes a lot of effort. On, on my side, sitting down and writing academic things, though, in a funny way, refreshed me and, and revitalized me. Sitting down and, and know, figuring out some, some aspect of choice of law or non-arbitrability, understanding why Article 5.1D meant one thing instead of another thing, coming up with, with some forgotten secret of the history of international arbitration always made me feel more alive and more, more eager about going into hearing prep or or meetings with a difficult client or whatnot. So I think, in a sense, going back to, to my discussion about, about building snowmen and snow women, um, just spending a lot of time piece by piece in a, in a persistent way, um, even if you lose sleep and lose some private time, is a, an important investment. You have to decide that it's more worthwhile to have, have a book or a little bit of profile than, than um, to have a week on the beach or whatever the alternative is, but that's a choice everyone's got to make. If I can ask a follow-up, uh, in terms of how much time it took you, if you can estimate, and, and how you organized it, is it uh, one hour, uh, five hours a night, or was it one year, two years without vacations and <laughs> on the beach? So, um, again, you should do what I, um, what I say, not what I do. So, I, this started out, this two-volume work, which is now the second edition of three volumes, started out as a case book on international arbitration in the United States, and not a particularly good case book. I, I put it together so that U.S. law professors would be able to teach international arbitration, and it was really very, very U.S.-centric. It was focused on, on the interaction between U.S. courts and, and arbitration seated in the United States, how U.S. courts would recognize and enforce foreign awards, also international arbitration agreements. It wasn't that long a book, it was sort of 900 pages or so, but that included lots, no, that included lots of case, case excerpts in the classic American sort of case book style. And so then I had this bright idea. I'll turn that case book into a treatise. I'll, I'll get rid of all those excerpts of cases, which would have reduced it from like 900 to maybe down to like 150 pages. Mm -hmm. And I'll turn the introductory bits to each of the chapters. I'll expand them a little bit and stick some footnotes in. And I'll turn the notes so that we're at the end of each case, I'll turn them into discussion. And instead of the case excerpts, I'll just stick in some more text that describes the cases that I'm taking out. And I'll be done. And I thought this whole process would take nine months, 12 months. Five years later, <laughs> conservatively, 5,000 hours later, conservatively, um, it looked nothing like the thing that it started from. The snowman analogy is, again, a good example. It, it sort of accumulated girth as it, as it went along. Um, the organization ended up having nothing to do with, um, uh, with the original organization of, of the book. It, it got lots more chapters. Um, it had new topics that I hadn't addressed, rights and duties of arbitrators, confidentiality, lots of, of topics that I hadn't addressed at all in, in the case book. Um, I ultimately, in terms of organization, just looked at the life of an arbitration and all the issues that would arise, used a basic principle. I always think it's helpful to try to divide things into three. And so I, if you look at some of my talks, bits, bats, and buts, um, I always try to divide things into three, past, present, and future. Um, um, and I divided this into three parts, not very creatively, international arbitration agreements, arbitration proceedings, arbitral awards. And, that gave me my organizing principle, and then whatever was relevant, I stuck into to, to one of those parts. Um, I treated it as a first draft, um, and I treat the second edition also as a first draft, recognizing that you'll make lots of mistakes. If you, if you sort of, I worked for a judge once, and he told me, and I, I remember I was so horrified when he said this. He said, once you've gotten 90% done with the opinion, you're finished. Send it out. And as a young law student, or just grad, recent graduate from law school, I was shocked. 90%, like 10% of it's full of mistakes. I, I just can't possibly do that. With this book, it was 90% and out. And it's actually a pretty good 
a pretty good way to approach things generally. You're never going to make it perfect, and how useful is that? How much, how much time do you have to spend to try to reduce that 10% to maybe 5%, and how valuable is that effort? Will you ever really be able to make it perfect? And how many of those changes you make actually don't move it from 90 to 92%, but actually move it back to 88%? Um, in any event, the book was the first draft, and it remains the first draft. I welcome comments on where I've made mistakes. I welcome suggestions to commercial break. Again, I welcome <laughs> suggestions on where I could introduce more Russian or other authority. Um, I, and I look forward to getting emails from all of you about how I can make it a better product, because I'm working on the third edition. Thank <laughs> you. Um, Another aspect I think is profile building is that the international arbitration community is a close knit circle of practitioners who interact with each other on a regular basis, who are also valuable in uh, building building your profile, your reputation, all that. But at the same time, it's an adversarial process uh, where advocates are expected to do zealous advocacy for their clients, and in the heat of a case, sometimes very harsh words are exchanged between also proposing uh, sides. So do you have any advice of how you maintain a balance, or do you, do you maintain a balance between on the one hand, zealously defending your client, on the other hand, still uh, remaining a person who directly say that your peers call you an awesome person? <laughs> so how do you do that? Um. So I mean, the right answer that you're supposed to give is you should always keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Um, you, you, you should never make enemies. <laughs> um, uh, you, you should you should never make real enemies. And if if your adversary if your adversary angers you, you should never strike back. You should always you should always maintain and. Even even disposition always always be the most polite person in the room. Always be the most respectful person in the room. And that I actually think that's really good advice to follow. I'm not sure I always follow it. Um, I get impetuous sometimes, and 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 either say things or take actions that that don't necessarily follow that. I think I think one thing that's really important is is to always even if you play rough and play with emotion, to play fair. And I'm not sure that that is such a helpful instruction in a sense, what's fair? Everybody might have different conceptions, but I think we all probably share whatever legal culture we come from, certain expectations about what's fair, what's honest, what's right. And I think it's always, always really important to, to try to be honest to that. I think where you can, ignoring, um, the kinds of tactics that are designed to provoke you. Sometimes you have people on the other side who are just completely unreasonable, who seek to antagonize you, to, to distract you by, by personal or emotional comments. Uh, trying really, really hard just to ignore that is both makes those tactics pretty useless and, and I think actually strengthens your position a, 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 an enormous amount with the tribunal. That said, it's a whole lot easier to say it than to do it in the heat of the battle sometimes. Thank you. Um, I think oh, this is a time pressing. I'll ask you a, a short question on, on, on social media, because you're quite active on LinkedIn. Uh, in what ways do you see these uh, um, social networks as useful, perhaps, in uh, yeah, I think that's the question. So, uh, my, what I've done on social media is more of an experiment than anything else, and I did it largely without encouragement or, frankly, approval from my law firm. I, I, I looked at LinkedIn and other social media, and perhaps a little bit like that president whose name I didn't mention, concluded, hey, this is sort of a cool way to reach a lot of people. Um, why, why not do that? And. Um, my takeaway from that is that it can actually be extremely helpful in getting people to think about the things you're thinking about and to pay attention to your ideas. Um, people, I mean, it's, inter it, it's interesting too, LinkedIn is, is used in different parts of the world. Um, I spent some 
I spent some time recently in India, and and all of a sudden there was a huge wave of interest in in things from from India. I went to China, and there was like none, <laughs> because China doesn't really play as part of the LinkedIn community. I think social media here, maybe less LinkedIn, more Facebook, has has been fairly active in the last in the last twenty four hours. Um, I think I, I think I also think there's a generational difference. I think. I think younger practitioners find it a lot more natural that you would get ideas and comment on ideas through what's called social media. Um, and if you care about influencing the development of the law, the development of what we do, then you ought to, you ought to try to present your ideas to, to that audience as well. That's part of why, in addition to doing these books, I did the, the webinars. Um, I think they're more amenable to, more like social media, but also why I do, do things like LinkedIn. Um, I think it's a way to communicate with a, a lot of people um, um, without, without having to go and talk to each one of them. Um, and we have one final question before we uh, invite the audience to ask many more, more probing, I assume, questions. Uh, and that is that you describe the various roles that, and the various hats that you wear, that of a practitioner, of an arbitrator, uh, of a writer, and of a professor. Uh, which of those roles do you enjoy more, uh, and uh, why? So, so my favorite role is being interviewed by, by, by a room full of people. Um, after my favorite role, though, I think it, it's hard to choose. I, I, and I think this is probably true of everybody in the room. I, I love variety. I love adventure. Um, and therefore, being able to do all of these roles at once is, is, um, is hugely attractive. Um, if I could only pick one, I'm afraid I'd have to pick counsel. Um, there's nothing that matches the excitement of cross-examination that goes really well, an opening where you've got the tribunal with you, a response to a tribunal question that makes it clear that the other side's case has been lost. The excitement that comes from that or from when the award comes in by email and you open it up and go immediately to the last page and <laughs> PDF and see that you won and got your costs is 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 pretty heady. It's it's nice to to conduct an arbitration super efficiently to have both parties happy with what you've done is hard to do and so that's that's really gratifying. But in terms of a direct hit to the main line, um, uh, success as counsel uh, is is unmatched. Since we promised a question about future, one of the kind of a short questions that I wanted to ask is about uh, technologies. So there is you've mentioned live now, which is obviously very helpful. I was wondering if you feel that there is a technology that is still lacking. It's still lacking. Yeah, it's so like not life novel, but something that you keep doing, and you think something could be done about mm -hmm. that technology. So um, I love live now. You, you know, we've been to too many hearings where they use live now. When you go to dinner with a friend and you don't hear what she says, and you look down at the table <laughs> because you expect it to be a live. I've actually done that. <laughs> you know, then you've been at. at spending too much time in the office or in, in arbitration. Um, I think live is such tremendous technology. What other technology? I think there are two types of technology, um, and they probably exist. I'm just too old-fashioned to have caught up with them. One, one type of technology would be to eliminate paper in arbitration. And everybody says every year, we're just, it's just around the corner. It's going to happen next year, but it never does. Um, you still have all the, the file folders, the bundles, whatever you may call them. Uh, you, of course, have, and people, people have their, their memory sticks, and, and um, uh, you have, have a lot more submissions with hyperlinks and, and those sorts of things. And they, they often are used in part. I'm not sure quite how one finally cuts the umbilical cord and 
and abandons paper entirely. I think finding a way to do that would would be a good thing, but I'm not sure I've seen much progress actually in the last three or four years in that direction. The, the same technologies are being being used in, in much the same way. And, and I don't know about you, but I've started actually not traveling with a laptop because dealing with security and login procedures and everything else is just such a hassle. I rely on my, on my phone. So in some ways, I've actually gone backwards in terms of technological innovation. That's one possible technology. The other possible technology, and I think this maybe is coming, is video conferencing and and sort of multi, multi-participant video conferencing. People often say, well, you shouldn't have video, video conference examination of a witness because you don't see the witness as well. You don't get the same impact as if she's in the room with you. I actually think it's the other way around. I actually think I can see the witness better on video conferencing. I mean, obviously, it depends on the technology and the connection and everything, but I've had, I've had cases where you actually, she's, she's closer to you. Um, the camera's focused more sharply on her than, than if she's, she's halfway across a relatively large room. I, I, I sort of like video conferencing um, examination of, of, of witnesses, and certainly for argument by counsel and so forth. I, where I go with all this is I wonder if one can't, before too long, have evidentiary hearings in which people aren't all in the same physical room. Why, why can't you have a hearing in which technology provides the link between people sitting in Moscow, people sitting in Geneva, people sitting in London or New York, and you can have the hearing in, in a virtual space. Um, that would offer a whole lot of savings in terms of, in terms of time and, and cost. <laughs> Now we can move to questions and answers session. Um, may I have a second microphone, please? My colleague Irina will help us. So, um, just... You need to turn it on and then yes, turn it off. Yes, the rule is that uh, two microphones cannot work simultaneously. That's why when you don't speak, please turn off the microphone. Thus, Mr. Ward will be able to answer the question. Yes, just technical issue. Um, so we will sit here and uh, let's do it like this. First come, first serve. So the first one who raises his hand uh, is going <laughs> to ask the question. No, 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 three, two, one, like this. <laughs> Sorry, just joking. Uh, just trying to administer somehow this process. So let's go. The first question, that one here. So, yes, I was the first to raise the hand. Yes, 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 I... I so, uh, uh, my name is Dmitry Artyakov, I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, Arbitration.ru magazine. And uh, my question is, what do you think is the paramount difference, I mean, in mentality between an arbitrator and a judge? That's a really good question. It's an interesting question. Um, I think part of the answer lies in the very definition of, of arbitration. What is, what is arbitration? Everybody has their own definition. You can look in different treatises. My definition, <laughs> my definition is that arbitration is a consensual means of finally resolving a dispute by, uh, and this is the important part, non-governmental decision maker chosen by or for the parties who will issue a final decision after affording the parties an opportunity to be heard. That's different from a judge because the parties in an individual case choose themselves the decision maker. In a sense, that has very strong historical roots in the French Republic in the Constitution of Year One in the 1790s, Article 86, provided that the right of the citizens, part of liberty, fraternity, equality, the right of the citizens to resolve their disputes by arbitrators of their choice shall not be infringed. That was a constitutional right in the French Republic founded on the Declaration of Rights of Men, Men and Women. Um, and I think that aspect of the definition of arbitration is critical to the character of the arbitrator. The judge is different. 
the judge isn't chosen by those two parties. He's chosen, she's chosen by the state and imposed on the parties in a very real sense. I think those formal, those legal differences are also reflected in the pragmatic characteristics and behavior of, on the one hand, um, arbitrators and on, on the other hand, national court judges. Obviously, there can be exceptions to this generalization, but arbitrators know that they are chosen by the parties, that the parties have resided confidence in them, have given them freely the mandate to resolve their dispute. And I think that affects how arbitrators behave towards the parties. I think they behave with greater consideration. And again, I know there are exceptions. I've seen arbitrations that have been pathological. But in general, they behave with greater, if I can put it this way, humility towards and respect for the party's opportunities to present their cases. There may be grumpy old arbitrators that are nasty to counsel who dictates things to the counsel. There are obviously exceptions. But in my view, those exceptions prove the rule. And for me, that difference, who chooses, who consents to the decision maker is a critical distinction between a judge on the one hand and an arbitrator on the other hand. <laughs> that girl was the first one. So don't have a mic? Oh, no, just, just, just a second. Okay. Mr. Bourne, thank you very much for being with us once more. Um, my question is the following. Speaking about launching your career into arbitration path, we should not avoid the statistics. And it's quite pessimistic because number of um, Russian arbitrators appointed in cases, it's quite small even in the CIS related uh, cases. Involving, for example, like giants like Gazprom and etc. Well, there are many aspects which influence it, but still, I was wondering, speaking about, for example, from your own personal experience, whether sanctions um, was the uh, that influenced the parties, the willingness to act as an arbitrator from a sanctioned party, um, sanctions of um, appointed part, sanctioned affected party. Thank you. Um, that's that's a good question, and I don't think, although although sort of focused in a sense on, on Russia and, and, and sanctions, I don't think it's a Russian specific question. I think it's a question that, that can be asked in, in other countries. We, I, I, I just came here from China and, and I heard with, with a slightly different accent and slightly different emphasis, similar kinds of, of observations. I've heard those those types of, of observations, those types of concerns in, in places like Brazil as, as well. Um, I think one, and it's easy in a sense for, for me to say this, and I therefore hesitate to say it, but, but it's what I think, so, so I will. Um, I think one has to look at this in historical context and the, the way the world looks today and how it looked in 1989 or 1990, how much change has occurred during that, those intervening years. I think one has to take into account the fact that many people who are chosen as arbitrators, for better or for worse, have either quite gray hair or no hair. Um, that generations that um, are still younger and, and have more hair and more normal colored hair um, are not yet at a point where many arbitral institutions and many parties, whether Russian or otherwise, would be nominating them as arbitrators. If one accepts viewing things with that historical perspective, then what one would hope is that the future would bring a different picture, that there would be the younger people in this room would have more opportunities as arbitration, as arbitrators and also as arbitration counsel, both by virtue of the education, the language, the substantive experience that they've had. I can't promise that that's the case, but I look at a jurisdiction like Singapore, where, which I know better than, than Russia, 
1992 when the Singapore International Arbitration Center was founded for the first time. It didn't exist before. It had a caseload of one case. How many Singaporean arbitrators were being appointed? Like none. Today, SIAC, 25, 26 years, I guess, now later, has a caseload of 450 cases, almost all international. A very significant number of those cases have Singaporean arbitrators. Does Singapore have natural advantages that Russia doesn't have? Does it have a bigger population? Does it have more natural resources? Does it have a larger economy? Not last time I looked. Um, can Russian legal community take advantage of those natural advantages that, that the country has? Um, I, I would think so. Um, I can't promise that that would be so. In a funny way, some of Russia's strengths may actually play against people who want to be arbitrators from Russia. Think about the number of arbitrators that, that, that are well known from the United States. It's actually not so many. And when you think about the reason, it's because the United States has a very large economy. US companies are involved in lots of international disputes. Nobody with a dispute with a US company wants a US arbitrator. Um, you want a neutral arbitrator. Germany has the same problem, and Brazil to some extent. The, the, the benefits, the strengths that, that Russia has play well to being counsel in international arbitration for Russian firms. They don't necessarily play so well to positioning like a Singapore, like a Switzerland, like a Hong Kong, like a London, as international arbitrator where you're required to be independent and impartial. I do think there's more scope for for Russian practitioners as co-arbitrators um, in cases where there are Russian parties involved. It's a, a kind of natural choice. And that's where I would think about as a young international arbitration practitioner in Russia. William Kuchera, Norton Rose Fulbright. Just shifting our focus to the Western Hemisphere for a moment. Um, the so-called USMCA and the removal of uh, NAFTA Chapter 11. How pessimistic should we be? <laughs> so it could have been worse. <laughs> um, one, one could spend a whole evening on, on, this, on this topic. Um, the president, who I've referred to a couple of times now, came into office promising that the United States would not would not sign, would not ratify the TPP Trans-Pacific Partnership in, in part because of its investor protection provisions. Um, he, he swore the, that he would terminate NAFTA, including Chapter 11, which has investor state protections. He ended up largely terminating Chapter 11, although it remains to be seen how this will actually be implemented, and if so, um, largely terminating it vis-a-vis -vis Canada, and um, significantly retrenching it vis-a-vis -vis Mexico, although keeping it with respect to quite important industries, energy, telecommunications. Um, clearly, it's not a step in the right direction, at least from, I think, the international arbitration communities um, perspective, but I would keep it in context on two levels. First, as between the United States and Canada, you have an interesting type of international investment protection in that you have two closely integrated economies with two highly similar legal systems. The Canadians in this room will no doubt quickly say, no, we're very different from the, 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 those in the United States, not Americans, they would say, in those in the United States. But the reality is you have two closely integrated economies and legal systems and cultures with shared languages, traditions, history, commercial interests, and the like. How international are those disputes, really? Maybe it's really like domestic disputes, and you already have a pretty good 
mechanism for resolving disputes there. Clearly the world would be better if there were international protections as well across that border. It's still a real border, but at least arguably it's a it's a kind of special case where what's at issue is 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 really domestic. And different things have been done in the case of Mexico where there are quite different economic, cultural, legal considerations. Um, and so I think one should keep it in perspective in, in that regard. If you want a really bad example, though, closer to home, of things going in the wrong direction, think about the EU. Think about the EU ordering the termination of all intra-EU bilateral investment treaties. That makes Donald Trump look like a chicken. I mean, <laughs> he just did one treaty with one country. All of a sudden in the EU, 27 or God knows how many sets of bilateral relationships with very different economic um, circumstances, very different legal traditions. I think that actually was a much more striking reduction of international protections and threat to <coughs> international um, international dispute resolution than what happened with respect to NAFTA. Next question going to Arno. Thank you very much. Actually, I will use the method of Sergey, and I apologize to everyone, but I will ask two questions at once. <laughs> but then I can pick which one to answer. Yes, of course, sure. So uh, my first question is uh, when uh, and how uh, did you first realize that you are a superstar in international arbitration? <laughs> I'll answer that one. <laughs> okay. And second one, because it's very difficult uh, to choose. Second one is, what do you think makes a good law, international arbitration law, a really great one? So I'm not going to answer the first one because I disagree with the premise. <laughs> um, and the second one, um, I think there's sort of two, two, two um, extraordinarily important characteristics or, or traits, um, or maybe three, maybe three. Um, and they all sound like they came from my grandma again. <laughs> my grandma lived in a, in a wood frame house with, with a toilet outside the house in the middle of the prairie. Um, and she had very good common sense. And so if I repeat her, her her words, um, um, it comes from a good source. The first was just plain work hard. That's what makes a good lawyer, and it's what, what makes a better lawyer. Um, Albert Einstein famously quoted, 99% of, of genius is hard work, and I think that's true of being a, of being a good lawyer. Being over-prepared for cross-examination, being over-prepared for the hearing, having done more work than you need to do for the written submission, having spent more time on your PowerPoint is all unbelievably important. And so I think the first, first trait is, is hard work. Second trait is, um, um, is critical to being a, a good oral advocate. And that is, it's much more important to listen than to talk. That's, I know, contradicted by, by behavior tonight. Um, but it's much more important as an advocate to listen than it actually is to talk. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to persuade somebody to do something. You're trying to persuade one arbitrator, the sole arbitrator, or a three-person tribunal, most importantly, often the presiding arbitrator, to do something for you, to dismiss a claim, to grant your client a bunch of money. And to get them to do that, you need to understand what's important to them. And the best way to do that, and you, gotta, you can look at their body language, you can, you can try to look at when they're paying attention, when they're not paying attention, but when they're on their phones, <laughs> when they're on their phones in front of, being in front of a huge crowd of people, when they're playing on their laptops and, and whatnot. But the best thing to do is actually listen to what, to what they say and, and how they say it, because from that, you can get a sense of where the strong points and weak points are. And so I think it's, it's, it's and then address that when it comes your time, your time to talk. Uh, I guess the final thing also is to always be honest with yourself, which involves a fair amount of humility in a sense. Admit when you don't know stuff, 
Um, a lot of times, you know, you, I remember doing this in law school, you read a case and you think, oh, I got that case, I understand that. But in reality, you, you didn't really understand it. Um, and a lot of times, at least in my practice, I don't understand something, the client will say something, the easy thing to do is to pretend you understand it or, or to assume that somebody will explain it to you later, but to, to really admit when you don't understand something and then push, you know, why, why is that so? Or how do we make that argument? Isn't that obvious answer to that argument this? I mean, be honest with yourself when you come up with a bright idea. Oh, I've got the solution to this case. I've got the brilliant killer argument. Be honest with yourself and say, actually, that argument doesn't fit with you know, this aspect of the evidence or that aspect of the law. I think those three, those three traits, um, which in some ways are the opposite of what you expect trial lawyers to be. You expect trial advocates, oral advocates, to sort of be thumping their chest and, and parading around. Um, but no, I think I think I think being more more modest is is and hardworking is the key. Next question. Yes. Uh, uh, I cannot avoid saying thank you, thanks to the four of you and and special and yeah, special Dr. McKenzie and, and special thanks. I, I think should go to those who came up with this way to hold the discussion because it, it worked really, really great. So to the question, um, when you are a practicing lawyer and when you are also a writing author. Uh, I think that your publications can sometimes uh, hit you back in your representations, and you cannot just <laughs> yeah sometimes even physically like like in this case yeah. but uh, and you cannot just uh, change hats uh, and uh, an, an idea you expressed some time ago in the publication may damage your representation of a particular client whose position uh, to some extent is different so. Uh, uh, are you mindful of, of, of this when you write something, and and what would, do you, do you think that it is a problem first of all, or and if it is, are you mindful of that when you write something, and what would be your advice to those who wants to have at least two hats in work? That's a that's a very good good question. It's one that I've encountered on other occasions. Um, I, I sometimes say that with. I, I quote a, a European um, saying or or aphorism, which is that when you write a book, you give your enemies the greatest weapon against you, um, and that's certainly been the case with with that and, and other books. We we have an in-house rule that we virtually never cite cite the treatise in, in support of our position, in part of the, the theory that it reduces the credibility of of our position if if we have to rely on. Uh, born, then um, and you can't find something else. You must be really desperate. Um, and so we try not to, to rely on a, um, ourselves. Um, on the other hand, our our opponents very frequently find ways to, to bring it in to contradict our positions um, and whenever they find an opportunity, and even sometimes when there is no, many times when there is no no opportunity. Um, I, I tried in writing it um, to to be emphatic about principles that I didn't think were contestable or disputable, um, and to be not emphatic and to be qualified um, and conditioned about propositions which were, were debatable. In, in that sense, I hoped to, in a sense, concede points which we would never argue against in any way. Yes, there is a doctrine of competence, competence. Yes, there is a separability presumption. But to be more, more qualified about, I don't know, what law governs the arbitration agreement or when, when a party would be denied an opportunity to be, to be heard. And thus, not to create real opportunities for someone to, to say, this, this book contradicts your position in, in, this, in this case. Um, I, I also denominated a number of my personal views as future directions, and in that way left open 
a difference between what the law is now and how I predicted the law might be at some point in the future. The fact that I thought that might be the law in the future doesn't affect what the law right now for this arbitral tribunal is. Still, inevitably, it does get, get cited back at us. Still, sometimes I take positions that when I look at them later, I say, gosh, why did I say that? <laughs> um, um, I have no doubt that the book will continue to be to be cited against me. I think, I think for advice for other people, in a sense, take into account what I said. But you can be emphatic about principles that you can't imagine yourself ever disagreeing with. And then try to be nuanced in the other things that you say. Recognize that a solution that you may propose or a criticism you may have may apply in general or may apply in certain circumstances, but it's not an absolute rule. That always, first of all, is probably right. <laughs> but second, it leaves you room in future cases to say that this isn't the, the general case. This is a special case for some reason. Before you raise your hands, oh, uh, just a small piece of information. Uh, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Just say. Um, Mr. Warren has to leave in five minutes. So uh, we have time for one last question. Unfortunately, he has another appointment where he should be present uh, for this reason. <laughs> Not electronically, but it's in person. Um, Thus, we would like you to raise your hand for the last time. And it's going to be the last question. Then we will invite you to the reception. Thank you very much. Oh my God, it's so stressful to ask, to ask questions. <laughs> so while we are on the subject of publishing and writing, uh, you mentioned that obviously writing a piece is a good way to, for, especially for a junior uh, people in the arbitration sphere, to put their name out and make it known. But sometimes, because they're so junior, it's, it might be difficult to get published, especially in a respectable journal. And what some people do is to write or uh, co-write articles, for example, with their partners in their firms. And I was wondering, would you, would you advise young practitioners to do that? And on, <laughs> do they have a choice? <laughs> <laughs> and on, 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 on the receiving end, when you see uh, a piece which is co-written by an associate and a partner, does it diminish the value and the input of an associate? Or do you see it as more of like the partner trusts that person, therefore he chooses to co-author with them? Thank you. <laughs> or, or does it diminish what I think of the partner? <laughs> um, I'm not sure that there's a, a, a simple answer to that. There is a trade-off. Um, I do think that it improves an associate's chance or a young lawyer's chance of getting published in a better journal if they have they have a, the, the piece co-authored by somebody with some profile. Um, and, and I think having some publication record as opposed to no publication record is a good thing as one seeks later to publish other things. Um, I would not do it too much, to be honest. Um, I don't want to betray all my partner <laughs> colleagues here, who no doubt like the availability of associates to co-author pieces with them. Um, but I would be I would be hesitant as an associate um, or a young lawyer to too frequently co-author because I don't think you get full credit. Um, for for a co-authored piece of, of that character. I think it's also very important. Um, I think it's very important just to do pieces on your own. I think, I think co-authoring some things and doing other pieces on your own sort of balances out um, somehow your profile. I think it also, I think the, the, the process of writing your own piece, taking responsibility for your own piece is also a very good process to go through and it does create externally in the eyes of third parties, clients, potential arbitrators, other firms, your own profile, which I think is really important for young lawyers. And everybody at, at all the various law firms here is going, including my own, is probably going to 
be unhappy with my saying this, but you're more than your law firm. You're yourself. You're a, a free agent in a sense, and you want to build your reputation in addition to, apart from, in some sense, from your law firm and writing your own piece, not associated with somebody else from your firm or anything else, I think is an important step in that process. So go forth and publish. <laughs> one, last, one short and last note. Uh, maybe you found uh, pieces of paper on your chairs. Uh, if you had time to fill in ICC Russia questionnaire related to Russia as a place of arbitration, that's great. Please pass your questionnaires to me or Mikhail. We'll take into account the results of the questionnaire and they will be published by ICC Russia. If you have time during the reception, that's also great. If you complete it, please also pass your questionnaires to me. Thank you very much for your attention, for your questions. Now I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Bourne and our colleagues Sergei Osovsky and Mikhail Karin for this event. Thank you. <laughs>